This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in. Welcome to this newest broadcast going out to you here in early April 2021. I am hopeful that this broadcast, at least in some capacity, will be out Saturday the 3rd of April, although it might be released on Sunday the 4th, Easter Sunday, one or the other. Um, It is the midday hour right now of uh, Saturday the 3rd. We'll see what happens, but that's just a time check. Hope everyone out there is doing, feeling all right. Here I am, evidently here and in one piece, so there's that. And uh, today's show is mostly going to be a mailbag program. I don't have anything original to discuss today, so we'll just get right into the uh, listener emails after our short introduction. You know, there are just nothing really good going on in the world, so... I'll still bring up a few current events, geopolitical affairs, etc. And that's really the plan for the broadcast. I would like to apologize preliminarily if some of this program today seems a little rushed, or if there are any uh, editing mistakes and or errors in terms of the production of this program. Now, the reason that I mention this is because about halfway through the the show as I was recording it, and then, of course, subsequently editing it, I'm starting more and more to think that it was just one person with a bunch of accounts, but maybe it wasn't. But I just started getting the impression that lots of people were getting uh, very angry with me, and I needed to just rush the show and just get it out ASAP. But I think... At the time, I was convinced that it was more than one person and that just collectively the listening audience was furious because I maybe they felt like I was dragging my feet too much doing another show. But after I kind of looked back at it, I I think it was just one jerk with a bunch of alternate accounts, just kind of, I don't know, just who knows what goes on in some people's heads, you know. Either way, I kind of, I felt like I needed to rush it a bit. And, uh, I mean, here, I I was still here for three hours pretty much doing the show, but I feel like I could have, it could have been longer. So what I might do next week is I might make another quick show. I mean, it might just be like an hour or two, because there's about 50 emails that I wanted to read in this episode. I just wasn't able to get to them. So next week I might just make kind of a shorter show where I'll just get to the emails I couldn't get to here. And then after that, we'll get to a you know, more fuller and show that's probably longer than that. So anyway, I would just like to apologize if the quality at all is lacking. I hope that it isn't, but if it is, I just want to let you know. I, you know, that's that's all. That's the elephant in the room this time around. All right. Anyway, for those of you tuning in on YouTube, there are three pieces of fan art in tonight's show. The first one is credited to a listener who goes by the name... Well, I I won't even attempt to try to pronounce it. I'll just spell it out. He gave me the Twitter handle. M-I-D-E-K-U-T-T-V. Midekut V, I guess. M-I-D-E-K-U-T-T-V on Twitter. The second piece of fan art is credited to Jacob. You could also find his YouTube channel. goes by the name Seneco, S-E-N-E-C-O. The third piece of fan art is credited to Diego. If you're listening into the show right now, as we will be getting into the mailbag portion right away, if you have any questions, any comments, any pieces of feedback, anything that you'd like to hear addressed on the air in the next program, again, any questions, topics, suggestions... Anything you want to bring up or write in regarding any topic, any subject, you could write as often or as seldom as you wish. You can keep your emails long or short. Just any feedback and correspondence is welcome. Truthfully, the more the merrier. Like I said, I'm going to be doing another show next week to just get to more, so now's the perfect time to write in. It's a blank slate. Do with it as you please. You can reach me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Again, via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Please remember that email address. 
that's the way you can get in contact with me. And then, you know, I will respond to your email on the air again in the next show. If you are feeling creative and you'd like to submit a piece of fan art to be featured in the next program, let your creativity flow, make whatever you would like, and then you can submit it again via that email address, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com, as an email attachment. Or you could upload it to a third-party image hosting site and then send me the link to the submission again via email. So that's how you can send in fan art and uh, reach out to the show. One thing that I wanted to uh, bring up real quick, I guess in terms of original discussion, this is about it. Uh, Some people were genuinely wondering about this. For those of you who watch and follow the YouTube channel, The Report of the Week... Um, the, the recent review that I did, let's find it here. It was of that Little Caesars thing. You won't believe what Little Caesars sent me, right? I think that's one of the only videos where I, I feel any way that I could legitimately use such a clickbait-esque title, and I feel that it actually possesses a, a good degree of accuracy. But some people were wondering, and I think legitimately so, they think, you know, because everything, of course, and yeah, this video, it screams viral marketing, doesn't it? So I think a lot of people, they watch it and they think, oh, this is sponsored, yeah, nice try, fell out, etc. This, I, I feel it was an attempt at viral marketing, but it just didn't work out. And number one, I wasn't going to play that game to begin with, that's just not me. I was creeped out by it at first. This is just the the whole story. I can't really explain this in a YouTube video because no one has the time for this. I was creeped out by it because there was no communication sent to me about this package. It just showed up one day. I don't have my address public. I didn't give it out to them. I don't have a P.O. box or anything. They just found it and took a gamble that they had the right person and the right address and sent it to me. And that just made me uncomfortable. You know, it's just my my feeling toward it anyway. The one thing also that I think kind of... A lot of people understood it, but some didn't. So in regards to the safe itself... Some people were saying, well, the batteries fell out. Why didn't you just put the batteries back in and, you know, then do it? You ruined it, etc. Well, this is what you have to understand. The safe, in and of itself, is sealed. The batteries are inside the safe. The batteries normally are supposed to be inside the safe, attached to the front door, behind the locked door. If the batteries fell out, rendering the electronic lock useless, and were rattling around inside of a locked safe, now that there's no power to the lock, because the batteries fell out. How am I supposed to open the safe to put the batteries back in without destroying it? Because the electronic lock is now useless. I think people thought that the batteries were outside of the safe and that the battery compartment is on the outside. You know, the battery compartment was on the inside of the safe That's why I was dead in the water. But, you know, it's just... I was really paranoid, too, either way, because what if, like, there was a tracking device inside of the safe? Or what if there was a camera or something, or audio recording device, or a camera or something that was triggered to turn on if you powered the safe and correctly opened it, right? Like, what if that was it in some sort of intrusive viral marketing? 
So even if it were, I don't know if I would even open it in the traditional way either way, because what if that would trigger something, right? So you have to start thinking, how else do you have to get to it? So that's just, you know, kind of a few details of the safe story that were omitted from YouTube. Either way, look, it was an interesting tie. It's a little more wild for my taste, but it's a tie. I could add it to the collection now, and uh, has a, it certainly had a story to tell along with it, didn't it? So that's what we have there. With that now, uh, I do want to mention on a final note, if you enjoy this broadcast, you want to hear more of it, you want to help support it, Donations are welcome at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com via PayPal, or Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. If you'd like to advertise on this broadcast, inquiries are welcome again to that email address. I think next week's show is going to bring about one or two, maybe even more new advertisers, so it'll be a pleasure to uh, welcome them on board, getting things set up right now, and... Uh, it's going to be great. Always uh, give these sponsors your patronage. They help keep this show on the air. They help keep it going. All right, with that, sit back, relax, and enjoy the broadcast. This is VORW International. The future of crypto is here. Rubik Exchange. Interest in cross-chain decentralized finance, DeFi solutions, is rising. Here's why RBC is the future of trading cryptocurrency. Rubik is a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange. Unlike other exchanges, such as Uniswap, Rubik bridges between financial assets and does so with lower fees. This isn't your ordinary coin that brings nothing to the crypto ecosystem. Rubik is a gateway to the future of cryptocurrency. Rubik is a multi-chain DeFi ecosystem which features cross-chain, peer-to-peer, and instant swaps across multiple blockchains, including Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Matic. Rubik is a complete, one-stop, decentralized platform. And coming soon, Rubik will also help your money grow with yield farming by providing liquidity for trades. You will be rewarded with RBC tokens when trades are executed. So why not check it out now? When financial regulators decide to crack down on crypto, Rubik and its exchange will be the gateway to multiple exchanges. The central crypto exchange. The future of crypto is here. Rubik Exchange. That's rubik.exchange. Rubik.exchange. Check them out. All right, and let's get into the emails now. Uh, two things to address right off the bat, because I really don't know how much of a detriment, you know, if anyone's even going to notice this or what, but it's just one of those things, you know, you just got to be better safe than sorry. Some people, they say, oh, don't really address these things, but it's just a matter of preference, and I just don't know how it's going to sound. Number one, I have the air conditioner on. It's just one of those days where... It just, it's just needed, that's all I can say. So if you hear this little humming in the background, that's all that it is, and um, I'm sorry if that's of any annoyance. Likewise, I'm just going to be carrying around the microphone, and I'm going to be keeping a steady hand. But if I just don't do a really good job at that, I apologize. I'm just not going to know how bad I screwed up at it until this is already done. And, uh... If it's annoying and I'm too loud and clunky, you know, I'll do better next time. And I'm sorry that if if it kind of takes away from the listening experience, I don't mean for it to, but, you know, if it does, it does. And I just know I don't mean for it to. It's, that's all. All right, let's get into some emails here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is... I'm just going to take it from the top and work my way down. Uh, some are short, of course. Some are long. First one we've got is a short comment. Hello, John. Jeff the Musician from Phoenix here. Just wanted to let you know I'm always lurking and listening, always enjoying your content. Take care from Jeff. Well, thank you, Jeff. I remember you. It's great to hear from you. 
I know for a while you were a listener to the radio show. I don't know if you are anymore, but I remember, you know, of course, you would always impart your musical uh, thoughts, you know, from, of course, your own experience as a musician on some of the uh, selections played. Always appreciated your comments, and uh, that was a couple years ago, but that always stuck with, that always stuck with me, so I remember that. Jeff, it's great to hear from you. So many folks from even a couple years ago aren't here anymore, but uh, good to know that you still, you still stuck around. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, over there in Phoenix, Arizona. All right, we have listeners sending in some questions and comments. No name was given, so we'll just go with anonymous. Hello, Review Bra. I've been a viewer of your YouTube videos since about September of 2019, and I've watched and loved every one of your videos since. I didn't discover your podcast until a few months later when I was working as a a dishwasher because I got tired of listening to the same songs in my Spotify playlist over and over and wanted to try listening to podcasts. Ever since... You've helped me get through so many tough days, washing dishes for hours at a time. Also, working at a really fast pace, it really drains you sometimes, and, well, listening to you talk about anything in the world helps pass so many boring and repetitive hours away. I work retail now, and stock items on the shelves in the mornings, and things are a bit repetitive and boring, but I can work at my own pace. Listening to your podcast nowadays... Uh, Still helps pass these long hours, stocking item after item all over the store. I don't mean to make this email too long, so I'll skip to the point. A few questions and topics. What are your opinions on facial piercings, your opinions on tattoos, and if you had to get one piercing and one tattoo, what would you get? I personally have ten piercings and no tattoos. Thank you again for all you do. I could never explain... In words, how much you help my boring, repetitive job go a little faster. So thank you for your kind words, and I'm glad that uh, that it helps. You know, I know that, of course, it might get a bit monotonous, but I'm glad that this is able to help pass the time and uh, just help with that. So thank you for your, your kind words. Glad you're listening in. Well, my thoughts on facial piercings and tattoos... This is, and if you've been listening to the last couple shows, uh, this is similar to my stance on a lot of things. My view as to how I personally would apply it unto myself is very different than my view of it in application to the general public. All right. In terms of tattoos and piercings on myself, all right, and this applies to me and me only. I take an extremely conservative approach. No tattoos of any sort, no piercings of any sort, uh, no matter what, none of those. That applies to me and only me. Anyone else, if you want to get a piercing, wherever, <laughs> I don't care, go for it. If that's what you want to do, then do it. Uh, if you want to get a tattoo, your choice. And uh, I would just recommend, in terms of tattoos, think it through and get a tattoo, if you really want to, with a clear head that you know you made this decision on your own. Don't do it while you're drunk. Don't do it while you're under the influence of any anything. A lot of people, they make stupid decisions. They get tattoos that they really don't, um, really don't know why they got it or they come to regret it. They have to go get it removed later. And if you're getting a tattoo, and you think, oh, let me get it in, um, you know, sometimes, I don't know if this is a thing anymore, but I know in the 2000s people would do this. You know, they get random characters from an Asian language. Sometimes it's Chinese. Sometimes maybe it's Korean or Japanese. But one of the East uh, East Asian languages, you know, tattooed on them, and they think it looks cool. If you're going to do that, for God's sake, make sure you understand what it says before you get it tattooed onto you. Just make an informed decision. These things often, they last for a while, 
and uh, sometimes they wind up being more trouble than they're worth. Like I said, I would never get a tattoo of any sort, big or small, or any piercing of any sort, big or small. But if you want to, I don't care. Just, you know, put some thought into it. Don't do it impulsively or make a rash decision. You know, make an informed decision. And if you want to, then go for it. It's your body, you know. It's up to you. Do with it as you please. So that's my view of them. And I think that's how it is for a lot of things. You know, I hold my own standards in terms of what I do to myself. I think extremely, extremely, I'd say almost to the point of traditionalist in some ways. But for anyone else, it's a whole different story. I think sometimes that's confusing because I think a lot of folks, what their view is unto themselves is the same as other people. So for instance, a lot of people, if they don't like tattoos or piercings for themselves, they don't really like them in general or other people getting them. Or if they do, and then they have a pro-tattoo or piercing approach to other people. Although the latter would be kind of strange if it's like, I'd have to be like some weird narcissistic thing. It'd be like, imagine if I answered this saying, I want to get tattoos and piercings here, here, and here, but no one else can get them. I hate them on other people except for myself. What a, what a narcissistic sort of thing that would sound. How strange. So as a result, that, well, that gives me a very... Uh, that's a very tough question you asked me. If I had to get one of each, what would it be? Well, I don't know. It's just I've never thought about this because it's never even been the slightest desire of me. I mean, if I want to be one of these jerks that sits there and tries to decipher the question, what, in terms of a tattoo... What are the restrictions upon its size? I mean, would, let's say, a tiny pinprick of ink in my skin constitute a tattoo? If it does, then fine. Give me the smallest, tiniest, little, microscopically sized blotch of ink, and there you go. Now I'm all inked up, and I'm... and now I'm all tattooed up. In terms of a piercing... Well, like facial piercings, I mean, it's as tough for me to interpret the question because it's not my strength at all. Um, you know, are, are ear piercings, are those, uh, is that constituted <laughs> as a facial piercing? I mean, is it? I don't know. I don't know. Or are we talking like, does it have to be nose or, or, or lip or any of that stuff? If ear is involved... Um, then put a diamond stud in my ear or something, you know, just... Oh God, I can't even imagine myself with that. But I would just say, just do it then, in that case. If I was forced at gunpoint, uh, just do that. If it were something else, aside from my ear, you know, as long as it's not my eyes, I've never really heard of such a thing. I guess it exists. If you want to pierce your eyelid, it's, ew, it's creepy. I don't know. But... If such a thing exists, if it doesn't, I'm glad. But if it does, it does. You know, it's, boy, that creeps me out, though. Um, but if not, you know, and you're kind of looking at nose, lip, whatever, just at, at that point, it gets, to, it, it gets to it where it's like, I really don't care anymore. Just flip a coin, and whatever it is, it is. <laughs> That's all. I guess my nose, because... You know, if I got my lip pierced or something, that might interfere with my enunciation or, you know, maybe eating or whatever. So I guess I would go with the nose in that point. But interesting question. Thank you for writing. All right, we hear from Ruben, who writes, I've been meaning to write in been listening to the podcast for about a year now after sporadically watching the Running on Empty food reviews. I greatly enjoy the energy drink reviews, and I love to hear about the energy levels and crashes that people experience. That's the primary information I want to gleam from that sort of thing more so than flavor. For the podcast, I'd like to know if you enjoy camping, 
maybe some thoughts on preservation. Pre oh, okay, this is in the context. If given the chance, um, if you would want to be a forest ranger, and what you would want to do, tend the lodge, maintain a trail, cook chili, etc. Sincerely, Reuben. So thank you, Reuben. My apologies for kind of struggling with the latter part of your email, but, you know, I got through it, and I know exactly what you're getting at. Uh, glad you enjoyed the Energy Crisis reviews. Uh, nowadays, I know I don't do too many of them, but I always try to emphasize the uh, efficacy thereof. I know early on I focused more on the taste than I did the durability, um, but I realized people really get the energy drinks for the caffeine. So I get it, and that's why I've kind of changed the focus there. Uh, in terms of camping, I know this kind of sounds weird. I've never been camping before. I've never been... I, I've never done it. I have never camped anywhere. Not in my backyard, not in a park, not in the wilderness, nowhere. I have never camped. Uh, I, I never have. Being a park ranger or something, that is... I think that's a noble job. It's uh, certainly something I could get behind, tending to the, boy, the beautiful nature, making sure that, you know, it's tried to be upheld and try to make sure that, you know, there aren't awful people that try to destroy it and uh, maybe try to help some other people out too. I could certainly, that's something I could get behind two issues with that, just from my point of view, though. Number one, I'm a small person, and I think you would just, in order to success... Now, maybe I'm wrong. This is just my impression, and I, I am not a park ranger, nor an expert of it, so I really don't know. But I would just have to assume that in order to be a successful park ranger, if you're out there, especially in the wilderness, doing stuff, you would have to be... You would have to have a bit more brawn than I do, and uh, that's a problem, number one. Number two, you would need to know what you're doing. I don't. So, th you know, those are my issues, but aside from that, I, I could certainly see that, you know, maintaining trails. I would enjoy the solitude of it, but, you know, an encounter here and there is okay. I just do all of that sort of stuff, you know? It, I wouldn't mind it. So, uh, thank you, Ruben. Could probably bring a little radio with me or something, and I'd get excellent reception out there, you know, in, in the wild. So, that's another plus. Alright, this is an all-caps email, in all capitals. I thoroughly enjoy your food reviews each and every release date. My question revolves around why here lately... It has been averaging around four days per release video. I get so disappointed when there is not a vid for that day. Would you please provide background secrets on how and when you decide to release your next vid? And unrelated comment, I absolutely love the way you thread and weave your dark and witty humor within the whole dissertation of the product being currently reviewed. I really hope this email reaches you. You do an outstanding job, sir. Well, thank you. I don't know how the all caps kind of... I always assume when someone writes in all capitals, it's of a negative temperament and intent, but that might not always be the case. Sometimes it's just... People do things for different reasons. Uh, I don't really know... I don't think that's a recent change at all. You know what, I'm logged into the account. Let's break open the statistics. I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to be combative with you, because that's not my intention. But I just don't think that this is as... I don't know if it's being implied this way, but it seems as though... You might be saying, well, it seems like you uploaded more frequently. Why, why don't you do that anymore? But I'm looking... And over the last year, so in March of 2021, I uploaded six videos, February 6, January six videos, 
I uploaded five videos in December. Okay, seven videos in November. Let's see, only five in September. Six in August, seven in July. Six in June, five in May, six in April, six in March of 2020. So I've really been averaging, I could definitely tell, uh, six videos per month with a few months being a little less, you know, with five videos, and a month here and there with a, a video more, seven. But overall, it seems to me that actually the upload schedule is actually very consistent. And the number of videos per month may fluctuate like this because, you know, some months have four weeks, and, you know, some months, the way that the dates fall, might accommodate an extra video or not. Um, but really, I would say just based on these numbers, it's of perfect reason that it would be about four days between each video, and that's how it's always been. The reason why there's four days between each upload uh, is due to the fact that that's just the amount of time that videos perform uh, best. And... You know, the YouTube algorithm is a tricky thing. I, I need to do this channel to keep a roof over my head. Videos... You see, here's the thing. You upload a video and it starts doing well in the YouTube algorithm, and it's being recommended to people, and more people are seeing it. Right, that's what you need in order for a video to be successful. If a video is doing that, and I upload a video the next day, the success that the previous video had is going to grind to a halt because I uploaded a new video. It's going to affect the YouTube algorithm and detrimentally impact a video that was otherwise doing good. Now, YouTube will tell you otherwise. They will say that every video functions independently of one another. But I have tested this on my own, and it's proven that it that doesn't matter. I actually kind of self-sabotaged my own channel just to test this back in July of 2020. The one video of mine, you know, the uh, Popeye's shrimp video from many years ago, was doing very, very good in the algorithm. And it was getting about maybe 100,000 views a day, which for a video that old is fantastic. And it was doing great. It was helping the channel. People finding that old video were kind of looking through my newer videos. It was getting more views to some of those. Of course, some extra ad revenue was coming in. It was really helping things out. I decided because I thought, you know, I had had this notion that you just let it do its thing and don't upload anything or it will impact it. But after I remember YouTube telling me that they function independently of each other, I took a gamble and I said, well, if they function independently of each other, if I upload a new video, it shouldn't affect the performance of this old video that was doing really well in the algorithm. I upload a new video, that video performs average, you know, on average, and the views of that other video, you know, the shrimp one, drops like a rock and went from about 100,000 a day to about 2,000 a day, just in that 24-hour span. And it was getting 100,000 views a day for about a week and a half before then that I just didn't upload and just let it do its thing. But the day I upload a new video, drops like a rock. I brought that up with YouTube, and they said, well, they function independently of one another, so that just had to be coincidence. But I just don't, I don't know, I don't believe it. You know, they can say what they want, and I have a lot of respect for them. But I did that firsthand, and clearly that result tells me otherwise. But just four days is about the right amount of time that it, it, it just works in terms of the algorithm, in terms of audience preference, because as much as some people might find it hard to believe, if you actually upload too many videos, viewers get sick of it. They say it's overkill, they get tired of it, they get bored of it, they stop watching. Now, that'll happen anyway, but it kind of prolongs the inevitable, and, uh, and that's that. It's just four days is the right amount of time. I've just determined that over the years, 
and that's just why I do what I do. But it's no recent change. I, I'm just trying to say this because it's been consistent. It's really been consistent this way, gosh, for like the last four years or so. So that's all that I have there. I think it's just a... Maybe a, I don't want to blame anyone else. It's just that's how it is. Stefan writes in, says, Greetings to Report of the Week. Just wanted to give you a quick compliment for the suit jacket you wore in your recent Del Taco video. I really like that style of jacket. I feel it's especially suitable for a warm weather climate like Florida. Hope all is well. Best wishes from Stefan. Well, thank you, Stefan. I appreciate your kind words, your sartorial compliment, and uh, it's much appreciated. That suit jacket, I got at a thrift store, and it was, uh, again, I got that in a thrift store back in 20, uh, 2016, it was, and I bought it because I've seen a number of jackets in that exact same style before, and it never really appealed to me, but there is one brand of suit that I just can't resist, and that is Ralph Lauren Polo University Club, and that was a, uh, that was a label of suits that I think was popular in the 1980s. It wasn't really popular, that's just when it was new, and I'm going to type it in right now. Typing with one hand. Lauren. Polo University. Club. Suit. And the thing that I find outstanding with it. Is it's just for me and for my. You know, just for my. Preference for suits. The cut is absolutely perfect. I mean, it's everything I have ever wanted in a suit. It really is. It's just, it's perfect. I don't know how else to say it. Because let's just take it with the top. The thing that is universal with all of these, you can look it up, look at any of them. All right, number one, the jacket is longer, right? I like that. That's my style. The lapels are wider. That's the other thing. Perfect. The pants, there aren't many good pictures outlining that. But the pants are pleated, they're cuffed, and they are wide leg, let me tell you. Not exactly like a zoot suit or anything, but it's just a very traditional fit. Comfortable. These suits are always in patterns and colors which are just what I'm interested in. I mean, they're just perfect, and they're high quality too. So when I see that brand, I mean, it's really tough to get now because, of course, the number is finite and only getting smaller by the year. I go for it. One of, um... One of my favorite suits, you know, is a Polo University Club suit from probably the late 80s. You know, it's this gray, single-breasted suit, you know, with a little bit of a pinstripe. And I wear that suit a lot because it's just so good. So I was in a thrift store, and I almost never see those sorts of suits in a thrift store. Never. I've actually... That suit I had to buy online. There is a Polo University Club suit that I saw on a thrift store, but it was missing some buttons and stained. Obviously, someone really got their wear out of it. There's another one I saw once that was just way too big. So imagine my surprise when I find this suit jacket in that exact style... That's in a size that I could actually work with. And it was available for like five bucks. Perfect condition. So I swooped in on that thing so fast. I snatched it up and uh, I just bought it that day. So that's how I got that one. Again, that was in 2016. You know, it's just kind of sad though over the years. Ever since I've started looking for the 80s and 90s suits, it's only gotten harder and harder to find them. When I first started looking in 2014, you could go on eBay and it would just be pages and pages of them. You know, you, you would just be, it was so easy to find these vintage suits and they would be so cheap too. But now it's just getting really tough. I mean, 
You know, it's just getting to that point where the people who really want them are obviously holding on to them, well, like I am. But with time now, and having some of these suits having been worn for a while, some of the poorly made ones, and even some of the good ones, obviously they've been around now these suits for like 30 years at a minimum, and uh, they're just wearing out. You know, they're just getting too worn, they're starting to get holes in them, whatever. And the quality is just deteriorating. So lots of those older suits are just going away because of that. They're just, again, wearing out. Uh, so many of them are being donated and are then, you know, being recycled and done away with. Lots of them also, you know, have issues, stains, tears, etc. Which, again, just happens over decades of wear. And uh, then what you're left with is just a smaller and smaller number every year. There's just fewer and fewer out there. And I was just looking, actually, a couple hours ago, just out of curiosity. Didn't really want anything. But, you know, I went on eBay, for instance, and I was looking at double-breasted suits. And again, back in 2014, you would see, like, 15 of those 80s and 90s, you know, vintage, uh, the 6 by one double-breasted suits on each page. And now it's just, you know, two or three, if anything. And that's it. That number is just shrinking by the year. If you want to get those old-style suits, your time is running out. At least trying to get them affordably. I'm just glad I have what I have, and it's just kind of sad to see it go, but... Like I said, what can you do? So thank you for your kind words and compliments. Geo writes in, It's been a while since I wrote to the show. Good to see slash hear you again, my friend. I wanted to know your thoughts on Merle Haggard and if you had any country music recommendations. Also, I don't think suits are going extinct like you think, so just keep wearing them, man. I'm planning to change to a bit of a semi-formal style as well. Hope everything's cool with you. Until next time, keep up the good work. So thank you, Geo, for writing in. No, and and no worries, you know, I was thinking about this, too. Even if suits go extinct, I'm still just going to wear what I wear. I mean, that's it. I'm I'm just going to wear what I want. Let's say I'm still around and it's the 2030s and almost no one wears suits anymore. I'm still going to be wearing them. I mean, if that's what I want to wear, then I'm not going to stop it because no one else does. I mean, no one wears wing collars with neckties anymore. But that doesn't stop me from wearing them, so it's just one of those things. I'll just keep wearing them, even if fewer and fewer people do. No worries there. Merle Haggard, obviously a famous country music, classic country, I should say. One song of his that I remember is Mama Tried. That was from 1968. I wonder if he... That was about his experience in San Quentin. Okay. Had a feeling it was. It's one of those, you know, I don't know, not prison songs, but kind of. But aside from that, you know, I'm familiar with his greatest hits, but I just don't listen to a lot of country music. It's just the one, I'm just not a big country music listener, but obviously Merle Haggard, a talented, accomplished musician, and even though I haven't really listened to much of his work, You have to give him credit for it. I mean, obviously, he was hugely successful, and he he evidently knew what he was doing. But Mama Tried, that was a good good song. I, uh... Well, I originally heard that song on the radio, and then I think many people discovered that song in the, uh... I guess that was the 2008 film The Strangers, right? I watched that a couple years ago, and that kind of brought that song back into my mind, and uh, I think I had it requested for my broadcast maybe once or twice, and I think I did play it. Yeah, yeah, good song. Got to number one. Yeah, number one in 1968 on the U.S. Billboard Hot Country Singles Chart, and on the Canadian RPM Country Tracks Chart. So obviously a lot of folks liked it. So yeah, Mama tried. All right, thank you, Geo, for writing in. We've got Tom in Ohio writing in. Sorry to bother you. 
uh, with a silly coincidence, but I was listening to one of your older VORWs on YouTube, and at the same time, I was watching CNN, and they reported that 114 protesters were shot by police or military in Myanmar. The VORW episode I was watching happened to be the one which you were speaking of, uh, I think six or so protesters that were shot. I had to do a double take to see if I was watching a live VORW, but sure enough, it was uh, a month ago. Sorry to bore you, but I have sleep problems, same as you. It's 5 a.m. here in Ohio, and I can't sleep and have nothing better to do. Anyway, I love your show, and I'm blown away to hear how knowledgeable you are at such a young age. I'm nearing 50 years old and feel dumb as a rock when I listen to you. But I listen as much as I can. Hope you never quit. You are the man. So uh, thank you very much. No, I won't leave you guys. I'll be here as long as I am. And uh, thank you for writing in. I try to cover and at least stay up to date on geopolitical events and affairs. Of course, lots of the you know, events and conflicts in the Middle East uh, really interest me, but a lot of people don't really want to hear it, you know, because it's kind of graphic and, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's a civil war, or, you know, it deals with extremism, etc. And I understand that people don't really want to hear about that stuff, but, you know, I extensively monitor the Syrian civil war, which, again, is still going after a decade. Although, you know, nowadays, as it's been for years... It's turned into a proxy war, and, you know, essentially the lines are kind of solidified. I mean, you know, you look at the Idlib province in Syria, and you look at how the front of that has really changed over the last year or two. It really hasn't, because, you know, you have different little sections of that province that are controlled by various you know, rebel groups, etc., but they are backed by Turkey. So, you know, you mess with them, you're kind of messing with Turkey. Of course, you have the Syrian government, which is backed by Russia and Iran. So you go too far with them, you're kind of messing with those powers. And then, you know, you have the Kurds, which the U.S. kind of has this weird relationship with. I mean, it's not like I don't think we would really back them up completely, but... I don't know if we necessarily, we do exploit it in a way to kind of, you know, have our influence in the region. And uh, not that we completely back them, but, you know, we do have our forces to certain degrees uh, over there in the Kurdish territory, or at least, you know, the SDF. But, you know, you have the conflict in Syria, the conflict in Iraq, the conflict in Yemen, in Libya, Afghanistan, etc., Right, so much to follow. Uh, one situation that, or two actually, that I've been keeping an eye on is number one, what's going on with Boko Haram in Nigeria. I think those of you who followed the news, really, you remember them from 2014. Uh, there was a time a couple years ago where it seemed like they were done, but they seem to be, uh, they seem to be on the rise again. You're hearing more and more reports of attacks and kidnappings from the Boko Haram extremists in Nigeria, which is uh, sad to see. And then a fairly new situation that you're seeing is in Mozambique, in uh, some of the northeastern provinces of the country. You're seeing an insurgency taking hold there. And, you know, the extremists over there have actually... They are territory holding. They completely control a good number of towns and potentially even some small cities. And there's active fighting going on right there. Very brutal stuff. And, uh, you know, the UN and what have you, they're kind of warning the people that live there to just, if you feel like you're in the path of these uh, militants, just evacuate and do what you can to get out because horrible things might happen to you otherwise. So... You know, I've just been following these conflicts. One thing that you just have to be aware of is that in certain conflicts, a lot of saber rattling gets done. And almost always it winds up being, you know, empty words. Now, the best example of that, of course, is what we see with uh, North Korea. You know, you see that so often. Oh, 
you know we're gonna we're gonna destroy the u.s we're gonna nuke this and nuke that and look at these missiles we launched but in reality i don't think anything's really at least in the near future ever gonna come of that but like clockwork every couple years you know you start getting these everyone thinks we're gonna go to war with them but here we all are still and you know same thing with uh, the situation in ukraine right now uh, obviously that i've been following for so long the war in donbass that's been since 2014 which it's a stalemate at this point but every now and then russia you know they play their war games along the ukrainian border and oh you know you see the russian military convoys at the border there and Everyone says, oh, they're going to invade Ukraine at this point. They're going to do it, but they never do. And we're going through one of those bouts right now. Uh, We're just seeing lots of, you know, military convoys in and around Crimea, in, uh, you know, near Donetsk, Luhansk, and even just along the entire Ukrainian border. But I, I think these are more... I mean, I think it's really saber rattling. I do sometimes wonder if Russia were to just go ahead and invade Ukraine right now, would the West really do anything about it? I mean, maybe export arms to Ukraine, but would there really be a war over that? I don't know. I don't know. Some people are adamant that it would be World War III, but I just don't know if there would really be that degree of direct intervention. I, you know, again, I don't think that Ukraine is going to get invaded at this time around. I think these are the same war games as always, and it's just the saber rattling, you know. Yeah, you have Sergei Lavrov saying, uh, you know, remarks about Ukraine, but I just don't think that's really anything all that new. But sometimes I hear these shows on the shortwave that are so confident that this is going to be it. You know, not to mention that these same shows for the last, you know, (laughs) four years ago, they said that Iran was going to be at war with us, and that never happened, so take what they say with a grain of salt. The situation in Myanmar is is dire, though, and that's one of those things that no one is going to do anything about. Nothing. It's just going to be the usual harsh words, the usual, uh, you know saying, oh, it's going to be, we're going to have some more uh, sanctions, you know, put on the uh, the military there, we're going to, the deep concern continues. Death toll over there is mounting, though, it's well in the hundreds now, sadly, and I don't mean to be a pessimist, but if it gets in the thousands, maybe even the tens of thousands, in terms of the West and any action therefrom, you could have f- probably 50, 60, 80, 100,000 dead, and uh, I don't think anyone's going to do anything about it. Yeah, Myanmar. It's just a terrible, terrible situation all around. I don't mean to say what I'm going to say, you know to try to come off in any sort of way, but it's just, I think it's just a fact of the matter. Sometimes people, like I was, I said this in the last show too, but it just continues. I mean, people, I get, get upset, you know, with the way sometimes they feel protests or riots get dealt with here in the U.S. You compare it to how things are in Myanmar, boy, it makes things look gentle here. It really does. Be thankful, be so thankful that you can go out and express your views and, you know, you don't have to worry about some soldiers driving by in a pickup truck just taking shots at you. Now, over here, you might have to worry about tear gas. You might have to worry about pepper spray. You might have to worry about the violent actions of some folks who are protesting with you if it devolves, of course, into a riot. Might have to worry about fist fights with counter protesters, or if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, maybe getting arrested. Yeah, every action has its danger, but you don't have to worry about overtly getting gunned down by the military for just being there. Let me tell you, those folks that are still protesting despite 
how many hundreds and hundreds. There might be thousands of deaths. There might, there's still a media black out there. Very little information gets in and out of the country. They're, they're actually saying radio is surging in popularity over there because that's... This is one of the situations where that's all that's left these days. And even all the local radio is government-controlled, so they got to turn to, you know, the old sentinels of uh, international broadcasting on the shortwave, but it might be thousands dead. Yet how, and I say this, some people, they use this term, just they throw it around so much, but I truly believe this, how brave the people are for going out there knowing that they could die just for being there, and still they protest for what they believe in. Now, how brave those folks are. They literally rest, they, they risk their lives doing this. They know the dangers, but, you know, they believe in this, and still they, still they, uh, they go and protest day after day after day. I, I find it commendable, anyway, but that's just my interjection. Some people will disagree, I'm sure. Some people, disrespectfully, I would feel, but, you know, they have a right to their opinion or say, oh, they're stupid for going out there and they'll lose their lives for nothing, but I just don't feel that way. It's just not how I see it. Hopefully it'll come to an end soon and this needless death will, will as well, but it's just a really bad situation. It's, I, I don't see how there will be an end or how things are going to get any better in the slightest. Well, <laughs> that was a real dark topic, wasn't it? On to uh, some brighter ones. We have a review request. Can't believe it. I shouldn't even laugh at this, but it's just the absurdity of it. Here I am talking about the situation in Myanmar, and then the next thing, we're talking about energy drinks. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's, I don't know where I'm getting with that. All right, we've got Hannah writing in. She says, Dear Review Bra, hope this email finds you well. The Monarch flavor of Monster has recently been released in my country, the UK, and we are finding its flavor to be quite polarizing. It is my understanding that this flavor corresponds with the Papillion flavor in the United States. Would it be possible to get your take on this flavor? Thanks and best regards, Hannah. So thank you, Hannah, for checking in. You know, I might have it right now. Give me a second. I'm going to step up. I'm going to take a walk over to uh, my refrigerator. Because I have a monster in there that I got to review. But there's so many out there. It might not be that one. I'm going to remember that name. I remember it right now. Papillion. I will, I will remember that. If I don't have it in the refrigerator, I will, uh, I will go get it. So, give me a second. I'm going to pause the recording, I'm going to walk over there, find out what I have in storage, and uh, we'll get to the bottom of this, so I'll be right back. Alright, I'm back. Well, to be the bearer of bad news, it wasn't. This was Monster Dragon Tea. God, there's so many flavors, aren't there? Alright, so Monster Papillion. Alright. I will note that down. I'll see what I can do. So thank you for your suggestion. Uh, well, next up, this is uh, a request from John, J-O-N. He requested uh, that I read this on the podcast. And this is a very particular request, but I'll do him a favor and read this. So make of it what you will. Hey there, review bra. Can you help me find my hat? I know it's a bit of a long shot, but please hear me out. I recently moved from the chili-topped spaghetti capital of the world, a.k.a. Cincinnati, Ohio, to the lush and humid confines of northern Florida. But along the way, I somehow lost my hat. I've unpacked all my boxes, yet the cap stubbornly remains missing in action. It's important for me to find it because it helps hide my receding hairline and thinning dome. Have you ever had sunburn on the crown of your bald head? It's the worst, I tell you, the worst. Anyway, as for the description of my lost wayward headgear, it's a green hat with the words, quote, Cypress Hill, unquote, embroidered upon it. 
I'd like to have it back because not only does it hide my male pattern baldness, but it also lets everyone know that I'm a totally chill OG party dude. I'm afraid no other hat will get the job done. I have a bizarrely shaped and proportioned head to which other caps simply won't conform. I am prepared to offer a $22 reward for any information that leads to its recapture. I know this is unlikely, but hit or miss, gotta shoot my shot. Anyway, thanks in advance for the help, and keep up the good work. Your podcast has been a beacon of light in this crazy mixed up world. So there you have it. John reporting in, moved from Ohio to northern Florida, missing a hat. It's a green cap, it sounds like. Or just a green hat, perhaps. Cypress Hill embroidered upon it. So if you have any information that will allow for its recapture and uh, let the world know once again that John is indeed the totally chill OG party dude, you could, of course, email me and I will forward it to him. Or if you want to leave it in the comments... And uh, maybe he checks, and maybe he'll see. So uh, we'll see. You know, I will I will be upfront about it. It seems unlikely that the hat will be found, but you never know. There are always stories, right, of lost and found, and people discovering, you know, their belongings, their luggage, you know, their wallet, whatever it is, and things getting found even over many, many miles. So you never know. I would say hope is not lost. And uh, we'll see. Maybe there will be a big break, you know. Look, you never know. Maybe you went to a gas station or something or a truck stop and you lost it there. And who knows? Maybe there's a trucker or something who picked it up there for some reason and is in possession of it. Or maybe the clerk at this place listens in and has it sitting there. I mean, you never know. Coincidences really can happen. So anyway, the information's out and I wish you the best of luck. And if it doesn't, I... uh, Well, I I certainly wish you the very best, and I hope you're able to find a suitable alternative. All right, so I took a short little break from recording, and uh, I really don't know what to do at this point. I feel like I'm in one of these situations. I don't know. I just don't know what to do. Uh, Part of me just wants to end this episode right now and upload it, because a lot of people are getting very angry with me for some reason that I don't really understand. They say, why uh, why the F aren't you uploading a new episode? I don't really understand it, because normally it's always in a two-week interval, so I don't know why people are so angry this time around. But then I know people are going to be angry at me, too, for, uh... They're going to say, why did you upload such, such, such... such tongue-tied. Such a short and poorly put-together show. So... You know, you have to... I guess I have to figure out, well, what group of angry people do I want to deal with this time around? And, uh... I'll try to rush it, but I'll get to a couple more emails. I wanted... I have about 70 emails I wanted to read, but probably just gonna have to go with 5 to 10 and, uh, wrap it up after that. So... We'll be, uh, we'll be real quick. I'm just gonna rapid fire through them as fast as possible. Maybe we'll get to more. And that's what it is. I'm sorry, I thought the two weeks was alright, but... You know, I, I'm not a mind reader, I don't know. So... Let's figure this out. And, uh, let's just again, real quick, one to the next to the next. Uh, Caleb in Minneapolis writes in with two questions. Number one, how much of your personality do you feel you owe to your family and their influence? And by personality, I'm referring not only to your gentle, cordial, and even-tempered demeanor, but also your sartorial anachronism. To be more to the point, I guess what I mean to say is, in the course of watching your videos and listening to your podcasts, I find myself asking who raised this person in this day and age. To be so modest, mild, calm, sincere, and also to be so confident in themselves 
so as to dress in a way that might at times elicit outright ridicule, because to them I say, well done. Uh, I would say, as with most folks, uh, definitely a, a decent percentage of uh, personality does come from my parents, and I think they did a good job. I think they tried their best and uh, are understanding good people. Now, as for my means of dress, that really, I think that came about on my own. I mean, my father wore a suit for work, but, you know, nowadays he just wears usually jeans and a, uh, a t-shirt or, you know, much more casual clothing. So, you know, he, he isn't one to just wear a suit every day casually or anything like that. So uh, I think that I just uh, assembled pretty much on my own. Second question, you say, is in regards to the accent. I know you originate from the eastern seaboard, and granted I am not familiar with the east coast accents, but your accent seems unique to my ears. Would you call it a mid-Atlantic accent? I know that the mid-Atlantic accent was popular in Hollywood during the golden age of cinema, and also used by many radio announcers and broadcasters of that time period. Your speaking voice in your YouTube videos and your speaking voice during your podcasts seem slightly different. Is there a reason for this? Or am I simply hearing things and or making assumptions? I kind of figured that perhaps you use a somewhat formal tone and cadence in the radio broadcasts and podcasts. Anyway, thank you for doing all that you do, Caleb in Minneapolis. Thank you, Caleb. So, in regards to the accent, it's a very unique story, and I told it a little bit about a year ago, perhaps. I'll be very quick this time around, but when I was learning how to speak, for some reason that no one understands, even to this day, somehow my voice was almost non-rhotic, or at least had, you know, pronounced non-rhotic qualities and characteristics. Uh, Some people in my family, of course, hated that, but my parents were understanding, and, and I could still communicate, and that was the most important thing. But I remember, these are just examples that were told to me, because to me, I was just speaking normally, but, well, I remember, you know, just the word, word, W-O-R-D, I would mostly say as word. I can't even say it that way anymore. It's with omitting the R, pretty much, but not quite, you know. You know, the word car, I would say car. And for most of my childhood, I really spoke with this non-rhotic accent. Again, no one knows why. I wasn't born anywhere that there is. Up until I was maybe 11 years old, I just spoke that way and I was fine. And I remember a lot of kids in my school would always ask me if I was British. (laughs) I'm not. But... Then when I started to become self-aware of how I spoke, and I eventually, you know, realized that I I don't really sound normal compared to my peers, I tried to stop that. And I tried to forcefully take upon a more, you know, Americanized uh, accent. And this was around the time when I first started doing the YouTube, so I was really trying to have, I would say, like a working-class New York accent. But eventually, you know, because that's not really how I spoke, it's kind of tough to maintain this facade when I'm so used, you know, my entire life to saying things a certain way and trying to keep catching myself and correcting myself really for no reason, so after a few years I decided, well, I'm just going to speak however I do. I'm not going to try to keep saying, talk like this, talk like that. Just let the words come out, however it is that they do, and let that be that. So as a result of that, especially over the last, you know, maybe four or five years, I've just, 
I haven't really paid much attention anymore to how it is that I talk. So what you get now, I think, is a mix of my original accent, as it was when I was a child, and some of the remnants of how I tried to force myself to talk, and that's, that's where my voice comes from. I think right now, for instance, with... Well, let's use this example, right? Car. All right, I try... I think the way it comes out now is kind of a combination between the two. The R is not completely... It's not very strong, but it's there. Again, car. I don't say it again as ka, with no R, nor do I say it as car, right? I kind of have it as uh, a little bit of a combination of the two. And that's just one example of many. That's how almost, I would say, my entire vocabulary is. Now, when it comes down to the YouTube food reviews, I guess it's one thing that I try, you know, even even then, maybe I try to be a little less formal in the reviews because it's more, I kind of feel like I'm not acting, but it kind of is, you know, it's like, you know how it is, you have to ham it up for the camera. And uh, that's one reason why I don't record these programs, because I could sit here and be myself. And yeah, the this, this show is a little slower paced, but I know I can just comfortably go at my own pace, which I'm not doing today, obviously. I'm kind of... I'm kind of uh, not even going by my own rules right now, but again, people are are so angry for some reason. I couldn't believe it, but it is what it is. And I just don't want to deal with that, so I'll, I'll relent. I'll relent to them. But it's just cameras sometimes. I don't know. Once you see them, you feel like you have to be... You have to put on an act. And that's all. Big Mike is checking in. Hello, Review Bra. A few things to share. Have you ever watched the movie Pump Up the Volume? It stars Christian Slater and was made in the early 90s. In the movie, Christian Slater's character has just moved into a new town, and his parents get him a shortwave radio so he can talk to his friends back home, but instead he uses it to make a pirate radio station that becomes really popular or notorious within the high school he goes to. It deals with some pretty heavy subjects throughout the movie and has become somewhat of a cult movie. I always think of this movie when you mention shortwave radio, and since this movie was made pre-internet, shortwave radio... Well, it was definitely a way that a regular person could make their thoughts known to the outside world. Public access television being another way. The other thing I was curious about is if you had a favorite cartoon, or maybe toy line, that you liked when you were younger, and if you ever get nostalgic about things like that. Thanks for all you do, I enjoy the shows. Thank you for your questions. I've never seen Pump Up the Volume, and I don't think I've ever heard of it before, Um, but it certainly sounds interesting, and I'll have to look into that. Cartoons, well, and toys. I always liked my Legos. You know, those are fun. Very, very expensive, though. Little uh, toy Hot Wheels cars, too, and um, th- those are just fun to play around with. Favorite cartoons, well, I wasn't a huge cartoon watcher, but I grew up with all of the old um, Cartoon Network stuff. You know, I remember... The Powerpuff Girls, Courage the Cowardly Dog, Ed, Ed, and Eddie, Dexter's Laboratory, Samurai Jack, and all of those. I wasn't really a big Spongebob watcher, although later on I watched some of that, and uh, those were a lot of the shows that I, I watched. I remember once I was scanning around on the television a couple years ago and I came across the uh, channel Boomerang. And I was watching some of those old cartoons that I hadn't seen in years. And yeah, it does bring back some nostalgia. It certainly does. Good question. Thank you. Big Mike, checking in. David in the UK writes in, I was wondering what you thought about heightism, as I am a five foot five male, which is quite a bit below the average height. I always feel like people don't treat me the same as a normal height person, especially in the dating department. Just wondering what you think about this regards, David. Thank you, David. 
I've never been one to really care all that much about how tall or, or short uh, a person is. I remember once I found some weird forum that was uh, discussing how tall I am, of all things. Who cares how tall I am? I don't get it. But they were trying to compare a picture of me next to Daniel Tosh, and they were saying, oh, he's, he's got to be this, he's, you know, and then they have these weird terms for people who are a certain height, and I was thinking, who cares? I don't understand it. You know, I, uh, I really don't. Now, needless to say, my priorities aren't in regards to any of that, so maybe my view is a bit different than others. Like I said, I just don't care one single bit, you know, how tall or how short someone is. Some people, I think, thought... I remember a couple years ago, someone kept asking, how, uh, how tall are you and how much do you weigh? So I just got sick of the question, so I just joked. I just said, I'm six foot five. 220 pounds. Obviously, that's just a complete joke. I am nowhere close to being that tall, but people believed it. They were saying, oh, yeah, he's a, look at how tall he is, whatever. I just shook my head. It's just funny. Look, I'm not the tallest person either, but it's just not something that I really think or care about. I, I don't think there's ever been once in my entire life that I've ever sat there and wished that I was taller. I, I just don't care. I'm actually glad that my height is the same, um, because at least all my clothing fits, so that's great. I'm glad I stopped growing, and uh, like I said, it's just not a priority of mine. I know some people, though, they really do take uh, height very, very seriously, and that's just something that I can't relate to. I mean, I think that could it be that sometimes maybe we misread things? I don't know. I remember watching that one video from, I guess, a couple years ago now of some guy, I think it was in New York, in uh, the bagel shop, who was just throwing an absolute fit because of his height. And I didn't understand it one single bit. It made no sense to me. And uh, I still don't understand it. Like I said, I'm not the world's tallest person. I'm not six feet tall. I don't care. That I, I don't even think about it. Never once have I. It's just not a priority of mine. So I, I can't really give an answer about it because it's just not something that I can really relate to. Not that I'm tall, but it just doesn't really register with me. I apologize that it's just not something that I can really... I just can't talk about it. I don't understand it. You know? I guess I'm just not one that's really, you know, physical appearances or any of that stuff doesn't really mean much to me. I, I, I don't care. It's just, that it doesn't bother me one bit. You know, you could have someone who's, again, six foot five and another person who's, you know, four feet, eight inches. I'm not going to think of either of them differently. Yeah, one is quite tall, the other's shorter. What's that? What's what's it to me? They're two individuals. Doesn't matter. I'm not going to think of someone any less because they're short, or anyone any greater because they're tall. Just is what it is. There's variances in height, and that's just the way we are. That's just the way that I see it. I know that this response might be infuriating. You might say, well, you don't understand it. Uh, maybe I don't, but it's like I said, it's just not something that I really think about, and it just doesn't matter to me. That's all that I can say about it, so I apologize. I know it's... I really doubt it's the answer that you wanted me to, to say, and... I'm not saying this to be antagonistic. Like I said, I'm not even six feet tall, but I don't care. It just doesn't matter to me. I don't know. I remember... Years ago, I don't even know if this is a thing anymore, but years ago, I'm talking... 2015 or so, back when I was on some of these sites, I remember I would always see these memes and stuff about, they would say manlets, you know? They would say, oh, if you're a manlet, you should go, uh, you know, KYS, right? I can't say that on YouTube, but you know what that means. Not very nice. 
you know, they make these diagrams. They would say, oh, don't even try if you're not six feet. Don't even, you know, you're, you're a subhuman, whatever. And I, I, I didn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now. I think a lot of these folks, it's just everything is in black and white terms. It's all about sex. It's all about appearances and nothing more. And this is not how I am. It just doesn't register. And you might say, well, you're just not, you don't have your eyes open to how the world is. Well, what do I care? I'm still here. I think I'm still doing all right. So then I'll keep my eyes shut then. What's it to me? All I really see with a lot of that stuff is just spite and anger. I'm happy with how I am, and th that's all there is to it. So, I just don't get it, and, and that's all. I. It went over my head then, it goes over my head now. Oh, <laughs> there's a little bit of a pun. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes, but that one, I didn't even think of that until I already said it. Uh, there you go. Yeah, that's all I can say. Sorry, I couldn't give a better answer there. All right, continuing now. John in Illinois writes in, Thanks for responding to my previous inquiry on your show. I am a truck driver, and your show helps keep me company on the long, lonely highway. I greatly look forward to your bi-monthly podcast. Now, to interject, see, this guy knows. He knows that it's every two weeks. It's <laughs> Thank you for your understanding, John. I'm glad you at least understand that and didn't cuss me out. I'm continuing, though. I will actually ration it out over my various trips, listening to one topic at a time and then resuming playback later. I really appreciate that it sometimes does last a few hours, giving me plenty of material to listen to over the couple of weeks between shows. Truth be told, I actually tune out of some of the subject matter, but I still enjoy listening. I find that most times I really just need a voice in the, bi in the background to help occupy my mind. I'd like to add that I believe many are drawn to you because of your mild-mannered personality, pleasant speaking voice, and it's very refreshing in a world of abrasive and controversial content. Thanks, and keep up the great work, John in Illinois. Thank you, John. I appreciate your kind words and feedback. Charlie in London, England writes in, Have you ever watched Doctor Who? And if you have, who is your favorite doctor? I recommend this show to anyone as it is funny, witty, emotional, and has a great storyline with great villains and an amazing community. Thanks for your great podcasts from Charlie. I have watched Doctor Who. Now, I've watched, you know, many of the classics and the contemporaries. I haven't watched it recently. I think the last I really watched of it was uh, when Matt Smith was the Doctor. Now, of course, my favorite Doctor was David Tennant. Uh, he was just great. But Christopher Eccleston, I know he wasn't really a doctor for a while, but I, I thought he was great too. So both of them were uh, were fantastic, but they were probably my favorites, but, you know, I really, I, I can see, I can see the positives for all of them. I mean, even William Hartnell, he, I, I think some people give him a hard time because, you know, it's way back in the early 60s, pretty much, but I, I still thought he did a good job, and, you know, I, I've watched a lot of the classic Doctor Who, and then again, in the 2000s, too, it is a good show. I I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you, Charlie, for your email. Keith in New Hampshire checks in. Second-time listener, thinking about investing in a shortwave radio for better quality uh, instead of listening on my phone. Any good recommendations? I get this question a lot, but I'll be happy to just give a few quick recommendations for you and anyone interested. Uh, I highly recommend the Texun, that's T-E-C-S-U-N, P-L-3-80, or the Texun PL-310ET receivers. They're around the $50 range, but sometimes you can get them a little cheaper. I think they are very effective, very good radios. They pick up a lot of stations, and uh, they just—they really do a good job. I would recommend those two radios. 
I would also recommend investing in a wire antenna. Um, you can find those very easily on Amazon, too. And that should boost reception exponentially. If you're in North America, tune in to the shortwave frequency of 5850 kilohertz. That's 5850, 5.850 megahertz. At 10 p.m. Eastern, that's 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening. That's my main broadcast to North America. Four new shows a week, four extra hours of content, week after week after week after week. So that's how you can listen in. I'll get you more detailed response in writing. And uh, there we go. We hear from Ivy in Yekaterinburg, Russia. And I know I really got that name horribly wrong, but I hope you know I tried. Saying, it's been a few months since I found your channel and then started listening to the podcasts. And I wanted to thank you so much. It's a wonderful pleasure and I always enjoy listening to the podcasts. I'm feeling like my English vocabulary really isn't enough to express my genuine gratitude, but I wish you to be happy, healthy, and continue to make this world better. Two questions. Number one, can I listen to your radio broadcasts from my city? If yes, would I need any special equipment? My grandfather was a radio engineer, so he probably has everything uh, so I can borrow. Now, let me just look right now, because it's maybe, maybe not. So let me just Google the name of your city. All right, I just looked. I don't know. I don't know. I can't make any promises. I, look, to tell you the truth, I think it's more on... More likely than not that you will not be able to hear any of my broadcasts at your location. But either way, if you have a radio, I will give you a few frequencies, but I would say it's just more likely than not uh, that you will only hear static and not my broadcast. But it's worth a try. I've gotten reception reports from Russia before. So if you have a radio, here are the times and frequencies to try, but I would just say be more prepared for failure than success, but maybe you'll get something. I had really wanted to uh, start up a broadcast again to East Asia, and I was willing to pay whatever was necessary, pretty much, even if that meant cutting a bunch of other broadcasts, but no one's interested, and uh, there's no... I don't even know how to get in contact with anyone there anymore. I've tried every single lead that I can, to any transmitter site and never get any response. So if I was able to start something there, um, I would have given you that frequency and that would have came in just fine, but unfortunately it doesn't because there's no resources left. But let me list a few frequencies that you can try, okay? First broadcast of mine that you can try is at the time of 6 p.m., Y-E-K-T, right? That's local time. I'll just say that local time. So that's for you. 6 p.m. local time every Tuesday on the frequency of 15770 kilohertz. That's 15770 kilohertz. 15.770 megahertz. All right, so that's the first one to try. The second frequency I would recommend trying out and this is a bit late, 2 a.m. local time, every Friday morning and Monday morning, on the frequency of 7780 kilohertz, that's 7780, 7.780 megahertz. That, again, may or may not reach you. The third frequency to try, and this may have your best chance of success, maybe not, is 9395 kilohertz, that's 9.395 megahertz, at the time of 5 a.m. every Friday morning. You can also try the frequency of 9395 kilohertz at the time of 3 a.m. every Sunday. It's no guarantee that any of this will work, but these frequencies chances are these are your best bet. 
So if you have a radio and you're a bit of a night owl especially, try it out and please let me know the results if you're able to get any reception over there. Your second question, you say, what kind of mood do you usually have? For example, if you summarize all the days in the previous two weeks, what mood would be more common for you? Some people feel a bit down most of the time, some are generally happy, or some are just numb and maybe it comes in waves. Thank you again, your content is a breath of fresh air. So thank you, Ivy. Uh, it's a mix. You know, I try to have a balance. This is what I say. Um, sometimes you have good days. Sometimes you have bad days. Um, but overall, you know, no matter what, and I think that's only human. Some people will say, oh, are you, why, why are you feeling bad like this, whatever, you shouldn't be, is everything all right? Of course everything's fine. I have emotions, I think we all should. Uh, nothing wrong, you, it's, you know how creepy it is to sit there with a the perpetual smile on your face. 24-7, I don't think that's natural, it's terrifying to me. It says something's wrong, quite frankly, if you're not willing to just look and see how this world really is. And, you know, be aware that it's not always good. So, you know, some days I'm real happy, other days I'm pretty down. But I try not to let that temperament, good or bad, affect how I would try to treat any other individuals. You know, I try to just treat people exactly the same, no matter how it is that I'm personally feeling. You know, the last few days uh, were mixed, and I had just been thinking about, you know, the way that this world is, the way society is, the way humanity is. I've told this a million times, I don't really need to get into this anymore. You know, it's just that I sometimes don't like a lot of what I see, and I wish it weren't so, but... What can you do about it? And that brings me down. I was kind of up a lot the last, you know, week or so just thinking about that. and You know, what can you do? You can't do anything, so that's all. But I'm doing good. Still doing good, taking care of myself. Everything's going good otherwise, so that's all. We hear from Charles, who writes in, located in Taiwan. I noticed your channel when you released the Travis Scott Meal Deal video. I also listen to your podcast before sleep every day. The reason I composed this mail today is I want to share a McDonald's meal in Taiwan that I eat almost three times a week. So this is interesting because obviously I've never been to Taiwan or a anywhere like that, so it's interesting to see the variances. So you say that the first meal I order is called the Mushroom Angus Beef Burger and a medium fries plus lemonade. I think the major difference between the McDonald's in Taiwan and America is the price. This is the most expensive burger on the menu, and the price of this burger is around $4, plus the fries and drink are $6. The meal is amazing. Another thing I want to share is that in Taiwan, you can actually choose a side plus beverage, and the price is always... $1.7. So I always go with spicy chicken and corn soup. So uh, this is really interesting. Look, I gotta, I, I have to confide with you. It seems like the McDonald's menu over there in Taiwan is way better than what you got over here. I can't believe you st still have the Angus burgers over there. You, you, you are lucky, I have to tell you. You're very lucky that you have the Angus burgers over there in... Uh, in Taiwan. I miss those things so much. They're su they were such good burgers. I used to get that all the time back in like 2010, 2011, 2012. Then they got rid of them. And uh, spicy chicken wings you have over there. How cool is that? God, I wish they... You know, they had chicken wings for a little bit. They got rid of them, but boy, I wish, I wish they were back too. Looks like the McDonald's over there blows the stuff that you got over here out of the water. Quality of the McDonald's over here in the U.S. is just slipping and slipping. And it seems like it gets worse by the day. And, uh, wow, it looks real good. I like the pictures you sent, too. So thank you. Over there in Taiwan. 
Ryan in Owensboro, Kentucky writes in, Two things for you, a joke and a saying. The joke, How much does a pirate pay for corn? A buccaneer. <laughs> That's one of those jokes. There, there you go. That's a good one. That's <laughs> a corny joke right there. The saying, It's a small world until they lose your luggage. Any thoughts? Number one, I thought the joke was funny. The saying, it's a small world until they lose your luggage. Yeah, I, I could understand that one. I could understand. It certainly does have its validity. Thanks, Ryan, over there in Kentucky. Good to hear from you and a funny joke, I have to say. Diana in Washington State. Listening online on YouTube, through the podcast sites, and through shortwave radio, too. You've mentioned multiple times that people find your voice and content very relaxing, some even putting it on to help them fall asleep. I myself listen to ASMR and other content specifically geared towards sleep and relaxation almost every night. I was wondering your thoughts on ASMR, if you've ever listened to it, if you've ever experienced the supposed tingles in real life or from content online. Some people find it creepy or just don't understand it, Anyway, hope you're doing well. Would love to hear back from you. Sincerely, Diana. Thank you, Diana. Uh, ASMR, I am well aware of it. I have never experienced it in my entire life. And I, I, I am convinced it doesn't work for me. I've watched video after video, probably thousands of different supposed triggers thereof, and I've never experienced anything. I feel exactly the same as I started watching it by the time I finished. So it just doesn't work for me. Nothing ever has. And uh, that's all that I really have to say about it. But just because it doesn't work for me doesn't mean, you know, that it doesn't work for anyone else. Um, evidently it does. And if it works for other people, then by all means, you have to do what's what works for you. You know, I find some of it weird but if it's really just as innocent as they say that it is, and it's just supposed to be something for sleep, then uh, I'm not going to question it. There's one channel, again, even though this it does absolutely nothing for me, I can't help but like the guy. Uh, I, think he's, I think he's German. It's called ASMR Zeitgeist. And boy, the guy, he's awesome. I think he puts in such high effort to his videos, and... Uh, if it's something you're interested in, maybe give it a shot. I I don't know. For some reason, I just can't help but like him. I, I don't know. That's just how I see it. And, uh... Yeah, that's all that there is to it. Thanks for your email. Next email comes in from Tyler in Atlanta, Georgia. It's been a while since I've sent in a conversational question for the VORW podcast since about mid-June of 2020. Back to the topic at hand, I was wondering, what's your personal caffeine sensitivity? I ask this because you have stated that you are a regular coffee and energy drink consumer and caffeine reacts with everyone differently. In my personal experience, while I enjoy the, ti the taste of iced coffee with cream and sugar for its flavor and for the boost in my energy, my body is sensitive to caffeine. Elaborating upon that statement while attempting to not give too much detail to your detriment, my body is sensitive to the extent where I cannot have more than 200 milligrams of caffeine without wanting to jump about like a kangaroo to the moon and back down to the earth. Uh, most adults can usually have a maximum intake of 400 milligrams without feeling like they've had too much. And to save you the graphic details, my digestive system doesn't react very well to coffee in particular, either shortly after the consumption sequence. In short, I like coffee, but unfortunately, coffee doesn't like me. With utmost sincerity, I thank you in advance for reading this message, and I look forward to hearing your answer. I always appreciate the disquisitions that you provide on a seemingly endless amount of different topics in your podcast, and thanks to your fellow listeners' inquisitive minds. Please do have a wonderful night and take care, Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. Good to hear from you. I know you tune into the radio broadcasts as well. 
Well, of course, my, my caffeine tolerance is a bit higher, I think, maybe because I just consume it more frequently, and it seems to react well with me. But I think I could probably get it up to 600 milligrams before I really feel anything. Uh, I know, for instance, that there have been days where I will drink a venti iced coffee from Starbucks. Mike, let's do the math right now. Let's look, let's look this up. Starbucks caffeine content. And let's find this out. So what do we have? Looking for venti. Venti. Let's find... Can we find the... the um, let me just search this up. Yeah, so there have been days where sometimes I'll get an iced coffee from Starbucks, and that might be, you know, three, four hundred milligrams right there, the venti. Then I'll take a caffeine pill with 200 more milligrams, so that'll bring it up to about 600, and then I'll drink, you know, like a... Uh, I guess it's a 16 fluid ounce monster, which is another 160. And, you know, I don't really feel shaky or anything after that. Again, that's kind of approaching even the 700 threshold. And, you know, I just kind of feel awake, but that's it. But it all depends. You know, most of the time, I haven't really felt... It's been a while since I felt shaky from coffee. It just... I don't feel any different... Regardless of the caffeine quantity I consume, it's just, I don't feel tired, which is good. That's, that's why I take it. It doesn't, doesn't make me feel tired. It's not any sort of miracle, like how Red Bull markets itself, saying it energizes your body and your mind, and, you know, before you know it, you're going to put on a helmet, and you're going to be some world-famous BMX rider doing all these, doing all the tricks. It's not, it doesn't happen. You know, I don't know, I just feel normal. That's all I can describe it. Now, when I was young, like 10 years ago, when I was first drinking down the energy drinks and coffee and the caffeine pills, whatever, you feel a little shakier then, but I think I've just conditioned my body to um, get used to it. And instead of feeling shaky, I just don't feel tired. But, you know, the quantity varies day to day. Uh, sometimes it'll be a caffeine pill and Starbucks. Sometimes it'll be caffeine pill and energy drinks. Sometimes it'll just be Starbucks and nothing else. Sometimes just energy drinks, nothing else. Sometimes it's caffeine pill and nothing else. Sometimes it'll be all three. Um, and never nothing at all, but, you know, so the quantity just varies. It's not usually all of them day to day, but it's just what it is, and it's... Uh, you know, it's just what works for me, but the tolerance is different person to person. Sometimes the limit is higher for some and lower for others, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just what our body is comfortable with. So thanks for your email. Always good to hear from you. Roy is checking in. Hope you're well. It's been a very long time, two years maybe, since I last sent in my correspondence, but I still listen to all of your podcasts on Spotify. Just wanted to say I started listening to your voice and commentary my freshman year of university, and it has aided me in my journey to graduate school physics PhD, as I'm in my first year as a graduate student. I'd just like to say, even though I may never actually meet you, I appreciate all the work you put into your podcast and YouTube videos. So thank you, Roy, for your kind words. It's great to still have you here tuned in, and I'm glad that these broadcasts and uh, programs have been helping you through your journey, of course, through school there. And I wish you the very best of luck. Hopefully, everything will go well with the PhD. And uh, soon, of course, in appropriate settings, you'll be able to call yourself doctor. So, uh, best of luck. Ryan is checking in. I thought I would write to you today about your talk about the decline of suits. Today, I was at work in an Italian kitchen, and I saw the rare sight in New Jersey of a man who came in with a full three-piece suit, 
I thought it was interesting because I got the chance to listen to the Thursday show today, and uh, that topic was a part of it a little bit. Anyway, I wish you the best, and I can't wait for another review. Thank you, Ryan. Interesting response there from New Jersey. Braden is writing in. This was sent a couple days ago, about nine days ago, but it's in regards to the shooting that happened in uh, Colorado at that point. Hi, John. I'm sure you heard about what happened yesterday in Boulder, Colorado at the grocery store. I've been living in Colorado for seven years now, and I have seen all these shootings happening around me. The high school I went to, STEM, was even shot up a few years ago, and I had friends that were in the building at the time. I transferred schools the year before it happened, so I wasn't attending at the time, but it's insane to me how something like that can just happen to a place that was so close to me. Chillingly, my cousin's friend works at the King Supers that was shot up yesterday, and she was luckily not there that day. Her and her friend go there all the time to hang out and just to talk, and I can't believe that another shooting happened that's within my bubble again. I feel like it's going to happen to me one day, and it's only a matter of time. I'm saying this because I'd like to hear your opinion on the matter, and maybe talk about what your beliefs are on why Colorado is such a target when it comes down to all these shootings. Sincerely, Brayden. Thank you, Brayden, and I'm sorry to hear that, of course, your local environment has had this happen again. Now, I don't mean to argue with you. It's not arguing, but I, I just, I guess I see things differently. I think we can get the view that sometimes our area is extremely prone to all sorts of bad things happening, but I think every area is really, unless you have a population density so low that nothing's really going to happen. I just think, my view of it anyway, where people are, the more people there are, the more bad things that are going to happen. But it's like, I think just bad things happen at different places. I mean, you know, look in Florida. Look at all the stuff that happens down here. Doesn't mean that there's bad people everywhere. It's just, you know, some bad things happen. But that's the case anywhere. Look at L.A. Look at Atlanta, Georgia. Look at New York City. And name any populated area, and there will be bad things that happened. Even up in New York, you know, I was up there visiting some uh, family, and this one restaurant that I had gone to a couple years ago, this one diner, someone got stabbed in there, and then another person got shot in the parking lot. You know, this one gas station that I went to, someone got shot there. Just bad things happen. A time or place, you know, we'll never know until it happens. But this is just how humanity is, I think. I don't think that it really has to just do with any particular area. You know, yeah, bad things have happened in Colorado, but the same is true for every state. And resultantly, I just don't think that we should live our lives in fear, you know, of when the next one is going to happen, because there's just... I don't know, I don't want to say it the wrong way. I don't want to say that no place is any safer than the other, that it could happen anywhere, you know, but it's just one of those factors that we can't control. And I just don't think it's something worth living your life in perpetual fear over. Because it, it can spiral into this loop, you know? It's like, I know that shootings and mass shootings are very, I know they're very horrific things. But if it's, you know, just getting killed that you're afraid of, well, I mean, there's other things that are more likely to kill us than a mass shooting. You know, it's like if the next time if you go for a drive, right, I mean, when you go for a drive, think about all of the fatal road accidents that happen, you know, in this country, and there's like a 1 in, in 13,000 chance on a, co a cross-country trip by car you take that you're going to die in a car accident just on any given cross-country road trip. Now, those are some factor in 
size of the population. Those odds, ooh, that's... Those aren't really good odds, 1 in 13,000. But just because of those odds, it doesn't mean that we should never go outside again, and never drive anywhere again, despite of that. And despite those odds and the dangers on the road, you know, we always see these crazy drivers and drunk drivers and people strung out on God knows what, going crazy on the roads and stuff. It's, you know, but just because we see that, you realize how many close calls there are. Day after day after day. Not a day goes by when something almost doesn't happen. But we still have to get from point A to point B. We can't let those fears plague us constantly. And, you know, same thing with other things. Could be shootings, could be stabbings, could be running, crossing paths, I mean, with the wrong person. You know, what about disease, viruses, pathogens, etc.? There's just so many things out there that could get us that it's just we have to live our lives still. I understand that it's a legitimate concern. It certainly is. The stuff... None of the victims, really, of these shootings had any idea what was going to come to them. But I just don't... You know, I don't think we can let these fears again plague us and, and bring us down completely. One thing that I would recommend doing, and I'm sure you maybe already have, but again, if you haven't, I recommend it, or at least be well-versed with it, there are many guides, because sometimes if a mass shooting, I think, happens, you could just be at the wrong place in the wrong time, and there's nothing that you can really do about it. But there are times during these sorts of shootings that your actions, while it's going on, can quite literally be the difference between life or death. There are some very good, very informative guides I would recommend reading. You could find them online about the best things to do if you ever get caught up in one. Read it, remember it, and if something happens, just recall that. That might be your difference between surviving and not. You know, I just wouldn't recommend trying to play the role of the hero, you know, let the authorities do their job and uh, just try to get that distance. That's what's most important. Get out of there. There was one video I saw of the uh, Las Vegas shooting back in 2017. There was some online influencer. Can't, I can't believe some of these folks. You know, while it was going on, this was at that big... Uh, country music festival, you remember that? And uh, this guy shows up there while it's going on, and there's a police officer trying to um, just get people out of there and just crowd control, you know, evacuate people while it was going on. This guy has the audacity to go up to the cop and says, hey, give me, give me your gun, I can take care of this, I, I can handle this, I can get this guy. And of course, you know, the police officer says to him, I don't know who you are, just get, get, get the F away from me. And obviously did the right thing, just don't play the role of the hero, just don't. That's my two cents anyway. I think I'm going to read five more emails, and that's going to be it. Maybe I'll do another uh, show, because again, I probably have, I'm just counting right now. Oh gosh. Let's clear out the ones I just read. So there we go with that. Let's get to page two. Because I want to try to upload this show ASAP. See, I have 50 emails here that I want to read. Oh gosh, and then 50 more here. I have 100 emails that I want to respond to on this show. And like I said, I'm just pressed for time, and uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just kind of you know, get to the next uh, show and try to do it pretty quick and get to more emails, but I just want to upload something just, you know, to upload anything, right? Because again, I don't know why so much hostility. I shouldn't, I should just quit talking about it. You're giving these people too much power over you. Let's see. Let's just pick out five emails here. The next question coming in from Alec reads, I myself am having quite extensive dental treatment next month. 
and I found it shocking to hear how badly a state your former dentist left your teeth in, to the point of serious malpractice. I am horrified that such people are out there who are so incompetent. I have even heard of unscrupulous dentists misleading patients and doing unnecessary work to make money. How are your teeth now after you have had the damage fixed? So thank you, Alec, and I hope your dental work uh, goes smoothly as well. Unfortunately, I still have a lot of work to do, and uh, I've kind of been growing increasingly pessimistic that I, at this point, I don't think my teeth are ever going to get better. I don't know, it's like, you know, you cut one head off, and then two more pop up, and then three, and then four, and it's very timely, very costly, and every time one issue gets fixed, another gets found, so, I don't know. You know, I am, I have zero confidence at this point that it's going to get any better for years, at least, and I'm probably going to have to get a few more teeth yanked out by the time this is all said and done. Not that any of that is planned, but just with my luck, that's probably what's going to happen. I try to take care of them, but, well, you know, one issue gets found, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. And uh, it's like, why, what's the point? You know, you just throw your hands up in the air, but I guess my main mission is to salvage whatever I can, and uh, whatever else happens, happens. <clears throat> This next email, and I know there are actually uh, are a few listeners with this name, but this email comes in from Ruby in, I believe, the Pacific Northwest. Apologies for the long message. I just now finally figured out that your podcast is a distinct entity from the radio broadcasts I've mainly been tuning into. I heard the last show and really enjoyed hearing your responses to listener emails, and I've thought, and I have a thought of my own that I would like to share with you. Throughout my years of watching your YouTube videos, I've always been especially touched by your uploads on suits, your fashion choices, and your various responses to questions about those decisions of yours. I think I'm the same age as you, and I've always been inclined to hunt down thrift store finds that are from that similar era. I love suits, blazers, ties, all of that, really. I am a woman, however, and I think this has ended up heightening a lot of the mocking and derisive comments I've gotten over my fashion choices over the years. I had a terrible day yesterday, including a long walk home in which multiple people yelled out mockingly at me which seems to happen every time I set foot outside in my small town. I wanted to tell you that in those moments, I think of you and your clear and confident steadiness. The harsh comments that you sometimes receive on this never seem to upset or hurt you, which inspires me, although I assume that at some point it was harder to face. I simply wanted to thank you because in those moments of random cruelty from strangers who have popped into my head, and made it more bearable. I'm certain that your videos and words on these kinds of experiences have both inspired and comforted many. Finally, I was sorry to hear the most recent episode that you're not feeling so well. I hope you feel better soon. Thanks again, and I look forward to listening to more episodes. Sincerely, Ruby. Thank you for your kind words, and I'm very sorry to hear that. You know, you have these awful, awful people, these truly degenerated individuals, I feel, that for some reason that I will never quite understand, feel the need to mock and scoff and insult other folks out there simply for appearing in a way that they want to dress. Especially dressing, I feel, with decency and dignity. Why are some people this way? Why do they mock people for wanting to wear what they wear. I don't understand it, and... Well, it's just awful that there's these people out there, but I understand. You know, it's tough. It really is, and I, I just hope that with time and your circumstance that it will get better. And I would just like to say, most sincerely, 
I have an awful lot of respect for you for not caving into these individuals and for remaining true to yourself and what makes you happy. And it's, it's really commendable that in the face of these sorts of individuals that, of course, say such things to you, you still, you know, you just want to remain true to yourself. So good on you for that. I, I really respect that. Yeah, there was a time, because at this point in time, you know, I get so many uh, bad words said to me on a day-to-day -day basis that I just ignore it all, because it's like, been there, done that, I've heard it a thousand times, and uh, it's just like, it just doesn't have any effect on me, because you've been exposed to something so much, and uh, that's it. I mean, it's just, just to put it into perspective, you know, I just get this stuff endlessly, day after day after day, so these comments just don't... don't, uh... affect me anymore. Like, looking at... well, just the, uh... comments on my YouTube channel. I just opened it right now, and this, this is what we've got from the last hour, pretty much, right? A lot of these are in regards to the uh, that Little Caesars video with the safe. Uh, you finally put your disgusting, long-ass fingernails to good use. All right, there we go with that one with the fingernails. Heard that one a thousand times. Yeah, you look you look more like a humanoid thing than what was on the pizza box. Oh, there we go. That's a good. That's a real inventive one right there. Here's another good one. Um, clip clip your filthy nails, bro. He looks like such, I can't repeat these two words, such a bleeping bleep in his cheap oversized suit. You look like a homosexual expletive. There's that one. Uh, let's see what else we got. You are a worthless sellout piece of bleep. All right, there we go. I'm amazed you have more than five subscribers. Who the F watches this S? And, I mean, these are just, this is just in one hour, and these are just the tame ones that come in. But it's like, none of this stuff bothers me, because it's just, it's literally like the same exact couple dozen insults, endlessly repeated day after day after day. So it gets real old real fast, and, uh, you know, you just brush it off. But it, it's just like, you hear it so often, it just doesn't matter anymore. But I remember when I was first experiencing that stuff, yeah, it hits on a different level. It, it really does. In your case, maybe it'll get to a point where it'll just, you know, kind of go in one ear and out, and out the other, but I know that that's no guarantee, so just stay strong, and again, stay true to yourself, keep your head up, and I wish you the very best of luck. Now, going over to an email sent from another listener named Ruby, Writing, Hello, John. I've been having a couple bad days, and especially today was rough at work. So I popped my earbuds in and tuned into your podcast from where I last left off, and my question was the next one. It really brightened my day, and thank you so much. I was shocked and a little embarrassed, as I'm pretty shy hearing it read out loud. I sounded like a bit of a dork, but oh well, the truth is I am. I hope my question didn't rub you the wrong way. A bit. I know it can be tiring to be asked so often why you are the way you are. I asked because, while I am introverted, I do crave to socialize and become friends with people, after missing out on that most of my life. Trust me, I'm not going to go to a club anytime soon, but I enjoy a good karaoke night with my friend and girlfriend. I was reaching out and asking in case you also felt that tinge of loneliness uh, when you do get the urge to socialize a bit, but find yourself with not too many people to turn to. I feel this is a bit late in my life to do this, but thanks to medication, therapy, and my wonderful friend Jackie, I've been uh, trying to open up and make more friendships. Before, I'd even be too scared to tweet a random thought, much less send an email to someone whose YouTube, etc. I enjoy. 
It's hard work, but it is rewarding, and I feel very safe, happy, understood, and accepted by some of the friends I made in the past year. I hope you have some people like that in your life as well. Guess I'm just trying to check in and make sure you're not lonely, and I would hate if you were. Also about the nails, I think it's rude people comment on it. The truth is, because you're not a beauty YouTuber and you're, I'm assuming, a guy, they see it as gross or something. But I feel you have very elegant hands and beautiful nails, and I've been trying to take care of mine more so they could look just as nice. I work with my hands, though, so I'm always breaking nails and getting really dry skin, but I try. Thank you for all the entertaining content you create. And thank you for writing in. I, I think that's really great to hear. You know, it just sounds like... I know nothing's really perfect, but to me anyway, and I, I don't want to rush to judgment, but it just sounds like you're in a really good place, you know, obviously compared to how things might have been. And it's just really great that you were able to make some new friends, that, you know, they understand and respect you, which I think is incredibly important, that everything seems to be going all right, and that maybe there's, you know, this sense of comfort, stability, and perhaps even a bit of a support network, too. So that's fantastic. It's, it's really good to hear. And, uh, yeah, as you could see, of course... In, um, <clears throat> sorry there. As you were seeing some of the comments recently, oh yes, these nails of mine are a very common target, but I don't let it get to me. You know, people are very antagonistic, and it might not be normal, but this is how I like them. I take good care of them, they're clean as can be, and truth be told, all the naysayers, right, say they what they will, they can just deal with it, um, because this is just how I'm going to keep them. So thank you for your email, always nice to hear from you. I think we can get to two more emails in tonight's broadcast, and then that'll be that. And like I said, maybe I'm thinking about doing a potentially, um, a potentially... I don't know, intermediary program where I'll read some more emails because there's so many I want to get to. And I think I'll just have to take a break again for the sake of the factors I've already expressed. And uh, that'll be that. This next email I think is a very important one from a listener who would like to remain anonymous. My email is in regards to social anxiety and how you mentioned that it might be due to a defense mechanism to protect yourself from the evils in this world. And I just wanted to share my personal experiences with you in relation to that statement. I 100% believe my anxiety comes down to the awful experiences that have happened to me in the past, and I wanted to share some of them to get it off my chest, as no one really takes it seriously or cares. I also wanted to touch on the question of is it evolutionary, or is there a reason? Not that I have a concrete answer or anything, but in my case, I think there are multiple reasons. Just for context, I am a woman, and a lot of these incidents happened pretty much when I was around the ages of 12 to 18 years old. I'm just going to make a bullet point list, as it'll be easier. So, here's just what has happened that's created a severe anxiety within me verbally attacked constantly, uh, being called a slut and a retard for no reason, completely unprovoked. Attacked physically, I had food thrown at me on one occasion, even an apple being thrown to my face, which absolutely killed, and on another, someone threw rocks at me pretty hard, which made me have a panic attack in the middle of the street. Might I add again, I did absolutely nothing to these people, they just thought it was funny. Being catcalled, a bunch of men leaned out their window as I was walking past, and, and they started shouting things at me and being sexual. One of my male friends at the time told me to take it as a compliment, but I refused to take that as a compliment, so he's not my friend anymore. I've been followed. A group of boys followed me while I was at the park and wouldn't stop, which made me terrified to ever go out again. 
And these are just a few of the examples of what happens when I leave my own home to be outside. And this is the real sad part. I haven't left my house alone in years because of this. I'm completely scared of the outside world now, all because people can't keep to themselves and leave others alone. I feel angry that they've left me with all of this trauma and they're probably doing fine, not knowing how badly they've affected me. I've started to wonder whether I'm borderline agoraphobic, as I sometimes have... as I have intense anxiety about going out. I'm okay if I'm with my friends or family, but never alone. I just can't do it. So yeah, that's my story. I just wanted to say, hearing you talk about how much you love to stay indoors and basically have the same dislike for people as much as I do, it makes me feel comforted, in a way. Like I'm not the only one in the world who is a homebody and introverted. I know a lot of people are, but I feel as though I was forced into this lifestyle, so it's cool to see someone who owns it and likes it. If the world was a safer place, I'd probably be more extroverted, but that's just how it is. Nothing I can do about it. So I've grown to like being inside because I know it's a safe place to be. Thank you for reading my email. If you got this far, it means a lot. And just remember, you help a lot of people. I know you know that already, but you truly do. And you're like a friend to us, familiar and comforting voice that we know and love. You keep us sane, you help us sleep, you calm us in times of sadness and anxiety, and we appreciate you so much. Again, thank you from an anonymous listener. So thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words, and it it really does mean a lot that this little program of me can perhaps be of the, the degree of help that it is, and it, it does mean a lot. Like I was saying, you know, with the one email from, I guess, a couple emails back, the listener who wrote in, right, about how she just wants to wear suits, you know, likes the way that they look, that's what she feels comfortable in, wants to dress that way. Nothing wrong with that, not hurting or harming anyone else. Yet so many people are so cruel, so mean. There's lots of awful, awful people out there, and, you know, one of the things that really opened my eyes to that is, of course, doing this YouTube channel, doing this, uh, this radio show, the podcast, and all of that. Because I've been able to, you know, through many, many countless interactions with so many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people over the years, I think it provides a pretty accurate picture of how humanity in general is. It's not all good. It's not all bad. There are, I feel, a couple decent people mixed in. You know, there really are some, some good people out there. But you've got a lot of people out there who are just... It's like they're hate-filled, you know? They're just so... It's a, But sometimes I really feel like they're evil people, you know? One thing that still puzzles me to this day... What compels people to do what they do? Because I just don't understand it. Why would people react in this way toward others who just aren't doing anything wrong, who are just simply existing and going about their day. Why do people need feel the need to say these things, do these things? Totally unprovoked, why? It makes no sense. Why on earth would someone do this and say these things? You know, I look at all the comments and stuff that gets sent my way, and I know that only kind of partially paints the picture, but what provokes people to say these things? I don't understand it. I, it's just there's things that I would never say and never do. Why do so many people do this so freely? Why, why do people see nothing wrong with this sort of stuff, you know? All of these questions, all of these... All of these concerns. Why, right? And after all these years, the only... The only logical response I could even conjure, for the most part, is because they're awful people. They're evil people. And whatever, however their mind 
processes things, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Selfish, narcissistic, you know, they have this complex that they're better than everyone else. They feel the need to just unprovokingly attack others, often verbally, but of course, you know, sometimes, well, like in your case, worse than that, you know, hurt you for no reason. Maybe not total, but definitely, I think, degrees of, you know, psychopathy, perhaps. Just as cruel people out there, and that's the only answer I could even say, you know? I don't understand why, but it makes no sense, but they just do it anyway. I just don't understand it. You know, it's like, why can't people treat each other better, you know? That's something that I wish. I think, like I was saying maybe an hour ago, or however long it was, I was pretty down the last, on and off the whole week, pretty much, you know, just thinking about the world, thinking about the way people are, you know, folks like in situations like you described, you know, it just, it brings you real down when you see this is, this is how humanity is, you know, and you wish it weren't so, you wish people were more dignified, were kinder, were more respectful to one another, could still have your disagreements, but... This is just animalistic behavior, in my opinion. And I know that there's no real solution. You know, you can't... You can't get in other people's heads and... Get them to... Change their ways, you know. You just can't. This is, this is how some people are. I wish it weren't so, so... Well, what does that leave us with? You know, we just have to try... The best we can... And oftentimes, if there's ways that we can, you know, distance ourselves from some of these awful people, then that's what we have to do. That's why I get it. I understand it, you know, staying inside, because, not to speak for you, but I would just wager that probably staying in causes less problems than going out and having to deal with these sorts of people. I know for me, anyway, that's one of the reasons why I love staying inside, you know, it's it's awesome to kind of, you know, just, you get to relish the solitude, it's great. And like I said, it really means a lot to know that this program has, you know, has just helped you in, in some ways. Suppose on a final note, I just hope that, number one, you know, there will be a day when people will come to their senses, you know, and realize, I think, really how senseless and degenerated and just awful these behaviors are, and we'll try to work to be better people. I I know that's kind of like a pipe dream, but that's still something that I earnestly hope for. And, you know, the other thing, of course, is that I know there's a lot of bad people out there. Again, you know, I see so many, even just in my own comments section and email, day after day after day, it's more than enough to leave anyone jaded about how people are, but one thing that I actually just have to actively remind myself, because sometimes when you're exposed to it so much, you start thinking that everyone is this way, and that's not true. I, I really, truly believe that, yeah, there are more bad people in this world, maybe than good, maybe not, I really don't know at this point, but I know there's a lot of awful folks out there, but I know at the same time, and I, I can prove it. You know, sometimes I have to prove this to myself because I just don't believe it anymore. But I know that there are good people out there, too. There are. There's still a good number. I just think the hardest part is trying to find those people. Because, you know, in, in life, it's just a coin toss. It's like, how do you know how these people are? You know, you don't. Sometimes you get bad people that masquerade as good. Sometimes, you know, there's some people who have problems, and they might not be the best people initially, but they really are good at heart, and they can change. You know, one email I remember that was sent to me like a month or two ago, I'll never forget it, you know, that guy who wrote in and said, you know, that he had kind of bullied others, but he realized that this just wasn't the right thing to do, and he, he actively went and changed his ways to be a better person. There, there really are, you know, there are folks out there. They, 
you know, they have a conscience. They know right from wrong, and they realize that, you know, maybe what I'm doing, it's not the right thing, and I want to try to be a better person, and, and that's good. It's, it's fantastic. The world needs more people like that. I know it's just kind of tough trying to find, you know, any folks out there who are sincere and who can help and who are decent individuals, but I guess what I'm just trying to say is we can't give up. You know, we, we have to realize it's not all bad. We just have to do what works for us. We have to do, you know, what makes us feel comfortable and safe, and we can still live our lives and try to navigate through all of this craziness, you know? Whatever that might be, it's different for everyone. You know, that's why there's things we can do, support systems, support networks, people, places, activities, things, etc., that can bring about comfort and solace. And we just have to do what works for us, and, you know, just we got to take it one day at a time and uh, put our best foot forward. I know sometimes it's easier said than done, but, you know, we just have to do our best. So thank you for your email once again, and with my utmost sincerity, I hope things get better for you. On a final note, we hear from Ali, who writes, Thank you so much for responding to my last email. I really enjoyed the whole podcast and had fun hearing about your experience with the personality assessments. As far as the question you answered off air, I just want to say that I understand my respect. Okay, thank you. I've, I've read through this. Thank you very much. On to more relevant topics. I know you and your listeners have discussed lucid dreaming before, so I apologize if I'm late to the party, but in the last show you wondered aloud if some people were more prone to lucid dreams. You also talked about some phenomenon, visual snow, etc., that some people might mistake as typical until they realize it's not. I thought it was worth sharing my experience uh, because it might answer it might answer your question. As far back as I can remember, starting around the age of two, I have been aware of my sleep state while dreaming. I can recall being able to wake myself up out of dreams as well as change the outcome of nightmares. As a toddler, this was mostly me telling the monster to be nice and them seeing the error of their ways. I would still have scary dreams, but because it was so obvious I was dreaming, I was never really scared so much as annoyed or uncomfortable. It's similar to watching a horror movie, it may be disturbing, but you have to understand it's not real life. I assumed this was normal up until my teenage years, when I finally experienced being in a dream without the awareness I usually had. It was very realistic and a terrible nightmare, and until I woke up out of my sleep, I truly had no clue I was dreaming. It was so unsettling that I told my parents and sister about it. I felt out of control, like I was losing my mind. I had to know if they had ever experienced such a thing. Well, as it turns out, most people didn't even know that they were dreaming until they wake up. I was shocked, to say the least. I remember asking them, how they could experience things so odd or out of place without knowing it was a dream. It seemed crazy to me. Now, years later, I do still occasionally have dreams in which I'm unaware that I'm asleep. Sometimes I don't realize it until I'm far into the dream to stop and think, oh, duh, I'm dreaming. And more rarely, I don't realize it at all until I wake up. I've always been able to control my dreams pretty expertly and can still wake myself up, but it does take a lot of energy and focus, so more often than not I just let things unfold and explore my dream world. I only learned of the term lucid dreaming recently, however I hadn't bothered to look into it or how common it is, because to me it's so normal. It's just the way I sleep. I do wonder, though, if any other listeners of yours unwillingly lucid dream, and if you yourself could choose, would you rather never be aware that you're dreaming, or always be aware when you're dreaming? Sorry for another lengthy email, and thank you for your show. I look forward to the next one. Kindly, Ali. Thank you, Ali, for writing in. Yeah, that's really interesting about the control that you have 
over the dreams. I think that's pretty awesome, actually. And, uh, well, if any listeners out there have any experiences you'd wish to share with that, uh, feel free to reach me and, and submit them, V-O-R-W, I-N-F-O at gmail.com. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Now, that's a really tough question, because I could really see both sides of that. You know, it's like, the way dreaming is for me right now, I am perfectly fine and content with it being the way that it is, right? So, I guess if I were to play it really safe, then I would just say, leave it as it is, because evidently it's doing me good enough and uh, I can live with it. But it is kind of, it is cool to think that you could have this degree of control over it, and it's like maybe you can have your own uh, almost sort of adventure every single night. Boy, that would be pretty fun, wouldn't it? So there's that. But as well, there's those variables that, you know, you can have good dreams and bad dreams, but that's pretty fun, though. It'd still be kind of fun to have that degree of control. You know, it is interesting, though. It wasn't really a lucid dream. But I do remember, actually last night, I had a dream, and I was able to control my actions. And I I don't think... I wasn't aware that it was a dream. But usually, like in my dreams, I just let it play out, and I don't really control what I'm doing. I just let it do its thing. But last night, I was able to have a dream... And I kind of controlled what I was doing, but I was not necessarily explicitly aware that it was a dream. You see what I mean? But it was like, I felt like I was able to think more, perhaps, directly than normal, which is interesting, just interesting timing. It wasn't really a big dream, but I just remember I was up in New York, and somehow I was going for a walk. Number one, I was wearing this blue surgical mask, but it seemed like it was way too wide for my face. And, like, the fabric was stretching all the way past my ears or something, and I was having a really hard time trying to keep it fastened. So that was the first thing that was just kind of (laughs) silly. This gigantic blue mask. And uh, I was walking down the highway. Of course, I recognized that this is a... This is where I grew up. I mean, I recognized the whole scene. But then as I looked up, you know, kind of into the tree line, I saw the Manhattan skyline right there. I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'd never seen this there before. That's really cool. Have I, have I just been missing this at the entire time? You know, have I been missing this the entire time? Is it, um, you know, is it because all the all the trees lost their leaves, that I can see it now. I never remember this view. It seems so different. And uh, I thought it was really cool, though, getting this view of the city like that. And I thought, oh, man, I I, I really want to get... I thought to myself, oh, gosh, I really want to get a picture of this. So I was reaching for my phone. I couldn't find it, and I thought, oh, gosh, I must have left it at home. And I was already a couple miles away from the house, but I thought to myself, well, it's kind of getting close to sundown right now. The sun is going down. I want to get it in this kind of twilight. I think it would look really pretty that way. So I decided, all right, I'm just going to be able to get myself to go really, really fast all the way back to the house so I can get my phone where the camera is and then get back there to uh, get a picture So all of a sudden, I was able to propel myself at like 60, 70 miles per hour, shoot all the way down the highway back to the house, able to rush back in, unlock the door. I grabbed my phone, closed the door again, and then I sped back off at this very high rate of speed back to where I was. I was able to get that picture, and then I began resuming my walk, and already it was starting to get dark pretty quickly, so I thought to myself, boy, I lucked out. I was able to get this at at the right time. I was able to look over, glance at these buildings, and it was so cool to see these giant skyscrapers towering over me, kind of at a distance, but still close. It was like, 
You know, it was just, I wasn't in the city, but it was like, it was right there. It was, it was cool. And then I woke up. But it was just interesting because in that dream, I felt like I was able to have essentially more control over my actions than usual. So that was pretty interesting. I had a couple other interesting dreams lately. There was one... I had a dream I was riding the public bus. But some... <laughs> you know, sometimes dreams, they give you the strangest ideas. I was riding the public bus. And, um... I was trying to get home. But somehow this public bus... It was a bus, but also a garbage truck <laughs> at the same time. And I was just trying to get home, but the, uh, the the bus driver, he was a bus driver, but also a garbage man. And he was saying, I'm like, look, you know, I have to do this route, so I'm just going to have to stop at every house and uh, throw the trash in the back of the bus here, so then I can take this to the dump, and uh, I'm just trying to work two jobs at once here. So, he had these overalls and these big, heavy gloves on, and, you know, he would stop the bus at every house, he would get out, haul the trash cans into the, to the back of the bus, and just dump the garbage out back there. And then he would just kind of scoot ahead, you know, about 20, 30 feet, then go to the next house, dump the garbage in, and then to the next. And I just decided, you know what, I'm so done with this. I wasn't even that far away, so I'm just going to get off right here, and I'm just going to walk, because I, I just don't have time for this. I just, I think this is utterly ridiculous and preposterous, and it's it's really gross, too, so I'm done. So I got up and left, and I think some of the other passengers were having second thoughts, too, so it's not, it's not like this is a normal thing, this is just how it was. So there was that. And then a third dream that I had... That was pretty interesting. It was a serious one, but it was kind of comforting in a way. I just had a dream that I was really severely sick with some sort of advanced terminal cancer, but I had accepted my mortality, and that was that, and I was ready. So, there was that dream. I'll, I'll omit all the graphic details, but... You know, it wasn't a scary dream. It wasn't like, oh my god, I'm dying, I'm so scared. It was just like, well, I guess this is just the way that it's meant to be then. And, you know, I've had a good, I, I feel like I've had a good time here. And uh, that was the dream. So, interesting, interesting stuff. And uh, I think that's really interesting that, you know, you kind of have these lucid dreams so often and so freely but at the same time, I completely understand how kind of going from that to a more traditionally regular dream is actually very jarring and scary in a bit, because it's like you're so used to having this control, now you don't. You know, what's going on here? This is this is awful. So I get it. That, that, that makes sense to me. So thank you again for your email. It was interesting. Some interesting perspective there. Dear listeners, that's all that I have for you. Thank you for watching, I thank you for listening, I thank you for allowing VORW to be a part of your day or night, and I especially thank those of you who, despite perhaps the delay in getting this program out, had the respect and the understanding to not go on a, a vulgar tirade against me. I'm only human, and I just thank those of you who were able to remain civil and didn't need to be so, uh, so combative. Thank you again, this is VORW.